Welcome to Imagine Otherwise, the podcast about the people and projects bridging art, activism, and academia to build better worlds. Episodes offer in-depth interviews with creators who use culture for social justice and explore the nitty-gritty work of imagining otherwise. I'm your host, Kathy Hanneback. This episode is brought to you by our new publication, Book Marketing for Academics, which teaches interdisciplinary authors how to identify and engage your book's audience, harness your unique skills and expertise, and help people use your book to make a change in the world. You can get your copy at ideasonfire.net. This is episode 32, and my guest today is Francisco Gayarte. Francisco is an assistant professor of gender and women's studies at the University of Arizona. He's a self-identified trans fronterizo and was born and raised in California's Imperial Valley, an agricultural community along the U.S.-Mexico border. He received his B.A. in Political Science and Chicano-Latino Studies from the University of California, Irvine, and his M.A. and Ph.D. in Educational Policy Studies from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He's currently working on his first book called Chicano Transfigurations, Excesses of Race, Gender, and Sexuality in Chicano Studies, which considers the relationship between trans and Chicano studies. His writing has appeared in Aslan, a journal of Chicano and Chicano Studies, TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly, and Chicano Latina Studies. He's the fashion editor for TSQ, which we talk about in the interview, and he also serves on the editorial board. Additionally, Francisco runs a blog called Al Catrin Consafos, a personal menswear blog exploring Chicano queer and transgender masculinities. In our interview, Francisco and I talk about the racialized politics of style for queer and trans subjects, how the classroom can be a social justice space, and what it means to imagine otherwise. Thanks so much for being with us, Francisco. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's just jump right in. You're working on a really exciting new book called Chicano Transfigurations, Excesses of Race, Gender, and Sexuality in Chicano Studies. What's that book about? Uh, so the book, which as most people experience, really just tends to shift and change over time. But what the culmination is coming to be is I'm really asking questions about various cultural texts that uh, and archival materials that I've put together um, to tell us something about what happens when, say, for example, uh, the brown uh, analytics of Chicano studies come in contact with contact with the analytics of trans studies specifically in relationship to questions of embodiment. So I'm really wanting to look at uh, through the through various cultural texts, um, you know, how I can theorize uh, a brown trans Chicano subjectivity. Um, and so it's not necessary and also kind of a way or a frame of making sense of race and trans together. Um, and so how I'm doing that is in this archive, uh, what I finally decided on is I have a chapter that's all about uh, Gwena Rahu um, and that particular moment, both in trans history, trans politics, uh, and activism and thinking of that relationship to how in Chicano studies this moment is not legible at all. Um, and so I'm really wanting to look at this moment as kind of a watershed moment that does something interesting. It's marked and thought of as a catalyst for trans politics around uh, hate crime legislations. Um, but I'm really wanting to think more about what is the impact or significance of the death and the trials of Guanajuato and the cultural productions that come out of that moment uh, for trans Chicanas and Chicanos. So the follow-up chapter to that is to look at a later murder uh, of um, Angie Zapata in Colorado. And I make a link between the two because Angie Zapata's family uh, very clearly states that the film that was made about Gwen Rajo's death um, was something that was very significant to her. It was her favorite film, and she encouraged her family to watch it over and over again. So this link does a couple things. It shows the significance of for a trans woman of color to have a cultural product that represents their experience specifically dealing with the nuances of the Chicano family. Um, but then also very 
disturbingly, provides a kind of a roadmap to the outcome for her. So what I'm doing in these two chapters is I'm wanting us to reconfigure how we're thinking about trans women of color, specifically in the narrative that revolves around, we only think of them in relationship to what happens when they die. Um, and so even though the chapters are about kind of the outcomes of the death, I'm wanting us to think a little bit more complexly about what it, what that representation of those deaths mean and do, as opposed to inciting us for action, but rather really kind of coming to grips with the everydayness and kind of the everyday violences that these women have encountered and the things that we can't see when the narratives get taken up to provide a, to be thought of as a political, as a catalyst for activism. And uh, the, the third chapter is based on archival work that I've been doing visit, by visiting uh, Lou Sullivan's uh, collection in San Francisco. And so Lou Sullivan was a uh, trans man who identified as a uh, female, female to male gay man. Um, and he was one of the founders of the GLBT Historical Society. And my interest of him originally was because he wrote a biography of this passing figure called Jack B. Garland. And Jack B. Garland uh, uh, as a woman who passes a man in the mid 19th century uh, was born the daughter of the first Mexican consulate. So I really wanted to pick apart how Lou was thinking about race in the context of California in, the, in that particular climate when California has just transitioned uh, in, from being Mexican to being uh, part of US territories. Um, and so what happened is when I went to look at his materials is I found a couple things. I found both an interesting way in which Mexicanness and brownness were treated uh, through the research that he did. And when I say that, I mean by the people that he was asking to find a history of Jack B. Garland and his father. So there's all these markers that lead to correlate um, that are about Garland's father being thought of as treacherous and deceiving. And literally in the report that's written by someone in the 90s at uh, City Hall in San Francisco, in this genealogical report writes uh, in their own interpretation, you know, the f if, you know, Jack B. Garland's father was someone who actively de uh, deceived people, it makes a lot of sense that Jack Garland himself would turn out to be someone who cross-dresses and also engages in deception. Um, so I'm interested in, you know, the actual materials that he compiles. And then I'm also interested in how Garland is wanting to historicize his identity as a gay man through a figure that is mixed race. Um, and so he's imposing the terms of trans and transgender and gay on a historical figure um, in a way that is a historical, but also is very much about Sullivan's own desire to want to historicize and make his own identity legible. So I'm wanting to look at how he's relying on uh, a racialized figure to be able to give us what we think of now contemporarily as you know the white trans male uh, gay man. And so I'm doing that by looking at both how he writes about um, Garland and also through the materials that he himself self researches and gathers to be able to do this type of work. Um, and so in a nutshell, those are like the body chapters. I'm still kind of figuring out what's going to happen with the conclusion. Um, but that's some of the work that it does. I'm really excited because I think that the archive is really unique um, and interesting and provocative. And so I'm hoping that the book will be legible both in Chicana Chicano studies and in trans studies and in queer studies. That sounds fascinating and certainly an important intervention in trans studies. I mean, so much of the, the great work coming out of trans studies these days critiques that earlier very whitewashing moment in trans studies, which a lot of fields have when they emerge, right? Um, right, right. And it just seems like this. there's a lot of really exciting, vital work happening that that points out the role of whiteness, the kind of role of race, the way that trans people of color were in the archive there all along. They were just used in this mm -hmm. this other kind of way. And it seems like this mm -hmm. is a fantastic contribution to that. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it's been very hard to write, especially when writing about violence um, uh, with the chapters on Arajo and Sabata. But, you know, I think it's coming along in a way uh, that I'd like. And 
as most folks know, with a book, you know, it's never going to be uh, the way that you want it to be. Um, but I think I'm finally getting to a place where I'm happy or okay with some of the arguments that I'm making. <laughs> nice. So one of the big kind of themes across all of your work that shows up in this book, but also shows up in your work um, elsewhere is fashion and queer mm-hmm. and trans Chicano fashion in particular. And so I'd love to, to dive a little deeper into that and hear mm-hmm. about what, um, what you find interesting about fashion, what you find political about fashion and how it fits into your, uh, your trans and Chicano studies work. Yeah, sure. Um, so the fas- fashion for me is, I think, uh, one of the most important sites in my everyday life. I mean, part of getting really dressed up is, is that has a lot to do with me being able to get out the door, to be honest. Um, so at the very everyday kind of quotidian sense, I mean, fashion matters to me because I think what going through the process of picking out what I'm going to wear, you know, um, uh, what suit I'm going to wear or what tie or whatever, or even, you know, shopping on eBay and things like that. Um, that's at that everyday level. It's so important. But when it comes to the bridge that it makes to the scholarship for me is, is you know, remembering, remembering when I learned about, you know, zoot suitors um, in that moment during World War II um, that was so important for Mexican-American youth to really kind of make a statement politically with the clothes that they wore um, and just, you know, thinking about zoot suits and how they are composed of an excess uh, of fabric um, really has affinities to me uh, with um, Jose Esteban Munoz's concept of brown affect and kind of this idea of the excess and his call for us to really interrogate you know, what brown excess does, right? Does it disrupt, um, you know, does it create possibilities? Does it create moments for affinities with other folks? And I think this is what fashion does, you know, whether you're wearing, you know, a three-piece suit or your style is something that is, you know, outside of that, I think that the way that we fashion ourselves um, is not just about adornment, right? It's a relationship between the clothes, the adornment, and kind of, our embodiment that really has some, that's something provocative about it and something that really kind of uh, motivates me, like I said, to get out the door. And the fact that I get to write about it um, also is just a bonus to me, right? So the fact that I can make those links and I've been, giving the, been given the room to actively engage uh, fashion um, at, in the scholarly sense uh, with the work that I do with TSQ. So I think that's a nice uh, transition into what is the fashion work that you do with TSQ? Um, yeah, so the, when I got to the University of Arizona, right, when uh, Susan Stryker had just arrived and TSQ was about to launch, uh, right? And so um, right away, you know, she and I had conversations about my interest in fashion and she talked to Paisley uh, and and they said, hey, let's have a fashion editor. There's not really a journal uh, out there that has a fashion editor. And I agreed and I was given, you know, very open kind of possibilities into what that would look like. And so the way that that works right now is that I've been curating folks to either uh inviting folks to pick out, you know, models or designers that they'd like to interview. I've written a bit of a scholarly piece to kind of open up the section that really calls us to think of fashion very broadly, right? So not just fabrics, not just clothes, but also art, uh, also performance, um, also um, thinking about the archive. So we have an essay in the issue right now that's about, it's called, you know, Finding Sequence in the Rubble, which is about um, questions about the archive and uh, archiving and documenting trans Latina life. Um, so fashion in this, in, in this section works very broadly. Like one of the things that I have coming up, um, is that I'm trying to work with Amos Mack to put some of his, some of his photography in the journal and also write a statement or essentially I've given him, you know, a blank page. You can do whatever you want. I want your photos. Um, and in terms of the writing he's has, he's been given, you know, uh, opportunity to do whatever he wants. So I'm really fortunate in the sense that um, the editor 
Chris, uh, Susan, and, and Paisley are very open in terms of what I want to do, and I think that that speaks to the general uh, ethos of TSQ. I think we're trying to be innovative, and I think we're trying to move the journal in a way that you know fits alongside with how trans studies is also moving, moving away from you know narratives that are directly tied to embodiment, but thinking about trans much more conceptually. Nice. A lot of the guests on our show have been interested in fashion. It w- it wasn't an mm-hmm. intentional theme at all, but but it seems <laughs> to have shown up, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah. It's it's fun to draw those kind of connections. Um, and a a lot of the guests have talked about why communities of color, in particular, not exclusively, but in particular, mm-hmm. have seized on fashion and the politics of style. So I'm thinking of mm-hmm. Mimi Nguyen, who talked mm-hmm. about kind of punk of color style and how mm-hmm. punks of color had to um, kind of transform what punk style meant and make it their own and and politicize mm-hmm. it in different ways. Um, Min Ha Thi Pham was on an early episode and was talking about um, the kind of the rise of Asian fashion super bloggers and again how they're navigating this largely white blogging fashion blogging space and have to kind of make it their own. Um, and Katie Manthe actually was talking about um, how professional dress is racialized, what counts mm-hmm. as professional dress. And it seems like your work is very much in line with that. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what the power of claiming fashion or style maybe is more accurate as resistance mm-hmm. and as as a specifically kind of racial justice politics or maybe a, a way towards a racial justice politics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so for me, I've always been into clothes. I mean, I think the 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 major influence for me was always my grandmother, who was a seamstress in a very small town and and a town that was very segregated. And so I remember her house being a place where people came into contact with each other that wouldn't necessarily be in contact. So she, you know, made dresses for African American women for church, right? She that was one of her major clientele. She also made the cheerleading outfits for the high, there's one high school, so for the cheerleaders in the 1950s. Um, and so in a segregated town where we have these, and also for Mexicans, so she made you know dresses for quinceañeras and for beauty queens, for the beauty pageant there for Cinco de Mayo. And so she represented to me, um, you know, someone who in her, in the space of her house, there was all of this connection kind of happening and she was the connecting factor by you know, making a garment, um, you know, laughing and joking with these women as they're fitting them or, you know, just being the person that my dad and his friends could come to to shorten their to shorten their pants and do cuffs. Right. Um, so to think of her as that, she's my primary source in terms of, you know, locating fashion and it having a particular importance or what I'm getting at is recognizing that her labor was much more than labor. I think that there was some um intersectional work going on in relationship to the various constituencies that she serviced and folks who were part of her clientele in a town that uh, was very segregated when she had the most clientele and in my opinion still continues to be pretty segregated. Um, And this is in Brawley, California, which is a small town about uh, 20 miles uh, away from the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, the large border town of Mexicali. So it's a really small town, agricultural town. So to think of that moment um, as a moment where, you know, I really loved clothes because I appreciated my grandmother making them and my mom and my grandmother would make me clothes. Uh, my, I would say my mom made me my first suit, um, which was in the form of a Beetlejuice costume. Oh, by how far cool. the best. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> by far the best Halloween costume I've ever had. Um, and so... You know, there's that moment. But then, you know, later when I moved, when I first moved here to Tucson, Arizona, I remember being very dressed up. I was not very dressed up, but I was very dressed up in a particular historical period outfit, which I would say would be, you know, kind of rockabilly-ish, you know, cuff jeans, uh, white shirt. And I remember being... um, Uh, harassed in the parking lot, Uh, these couple, uh, you know, college age white male students kind of accosted me and they were like being a wetback, you know, yelling at me, inciting me to have a conflict with them. And so it was that moment um, that I realized that the fact that, and they also said greaser, which also has its particular historical context. It's like they brought this term uh, from 
back in time into the present, you know, and it really felt like, okay, I'm starting a job. I'm, I'm a professor at the U of A and certainly how I look has a particular importance and significance and I need to have a presence. And so that was the moment where I decided that, you know, I was going to, you know, dress as extravagantly. Um, I, I oftentimes term it aggressively overdressed um, because Southern Arizona is definitely not New York and it's not Chicago, right? So people aren't necessarily wearing suits all the time. Um, and so I made it a point to really kind of challenge my students' expectations of who's going to be walking in the room, uh, especially in a place where faculty, especially male-identified, masculine-identified faculty are particularly casual. Um, and so I wanted to challenge them and seize authority a little bit as a brown man who's going to be their professor um, and really kind of show them that, you know, the dress that I wear is my own kind of sense of, sense of self, but also my presence and a way that I'm communicating to them that, you know, I have a particular authority, even though I'm someone that they might not expect to have as being in that in that role of authority. Um, and so, you know, I feel it all the time on campus. I can feel uh, stares that are not always admiring, um, for sure, um, when I'm walking around campus. And that tells me that what I'm wearing does some disruption and it's success and it's brown um, and the clothes are beautiful. And so that's something that gives me a point in which to kind of enact a politic of presence, especially um, at a university where um, there, to my knowledge, I don't think that there is another trans faculty of color on the campus. We have the Transgender Studies Initiative on campus, but it's, but I'm the only person of color in that initiative. Um, so, you know, to enact that sense of place and presence is where it becomes particularly powerful um, and um, significant for me. How do students respond? I'm curious. Like, do you do assignments encouraging them to think critically about style? Do you just kind of weave it in on the edges? Or do you do you get any students who are like, finally, we get to talk about clothes? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, depending on the class. I mean, usually um, when I teach about um, in and when I teach a class about gender in a transnational world, I always have a segment that's about um, sweatshops, right? Um, and so part of that. In that section, I always have students, you know, do like a what I wore today kind of picture um, and they have to submit it online and they have to document, you know, all the things that they've, that they've worn. And I ask them to, you know, talk about the fabric. Like, do you even know what the fabric is? Uh, where did it come from? Right. Like who made it? Um, all of the details. Right. To kind of see, you know, where they're buying their clothes um, and then also to tell me why they're wearing what they wore. Right. So it has to be about, you know, did you wear it because it's comfortable or is it your favorite blouse or et cetera. Right. To get them to think about how what we put on when we leave the door um, for a lot of people has a lot of significance. And it's about feeling good in particular ways while also being mindful of the politics involved in terms of where we buy our clothes um, and kind of knowing the origins of the fabrics, right? So I do get into it some, in, in some of my classes. And when I teach other classes that are more in Chicana Latina studies realm, of course, I, te I teach about pachugas and pachugos and zoot suiters and um, spend a lot of time on that particular era um, to really have students grapple with you know, how style and fashion um, was very significant for Mexican-American youth in Los Angeles in the 1940s and also in the present. Like one of my um, former colleagues in grad school, Nicholas Antino, is doing wonderful, beautiful work on um, kind of the revival of zoot zoo rockabilly culture in Los Angeles and how, you know, contemporarily Mexican-American, Chicano, Latino youth are, you know, having something more than nostalgia when it comes to the clothes. It's a, a, a revival of a particular period of history and a politic around fashion that folks are channeling into everyday struggles related to gentrification in Los Angeles um, and things like that. Do you think that enough interest or maybe scholarly space has been made in the academy for interest in fashion? Um, I mean, it, it certainly has gone from being considered a field that is not very important or not very valued in the academy to one that that is getting more and more kind of critical intention these days 
What um, what do you make of that that shift? Do you think we still have a ways to go? Um, I think it's great that there are. I see far more people writing about and thinking about fashion um, than say a few years back. Um, I think I would like for us to think a little less about fashion as something more uh, flip fr frivolous or just so solely concerned with you know. Uh, outward appearance, because I think that there's some fleshing out to do of the significance of, you know, actual thinking of actually thinking about fabrics and texture, right? Um, and how that might have some affinities, say, for example, um, I'm working on an article right now that will have a photography component to it. And so thinking about the process of some self making that is involved with fashion in relationship to, let's think about scenes, right? So in this in this essay, I will have pictures of my own scars that are really, really kind of close up uh, to be able to have them think about them in relationship to, you know, a seam on a garment, uh, right? And to kind of really flesh out the relationship between um, the the, the self-making practice that is about the body corporeal at the corporeal level and how that's connected to you know, the clothes that we use to cover up some of these things. Um, so for me, I think that we're getting there and I think there's lots of people that are doing amazing work. Uh, like one of our graduate students here in our program, Liz Verklin, just wrote an amazing dissertation on uh, sweatshop labor and kind of the transnational politics and the figure of this space uh, to really get us to think about uh, um, how we think of this space, the sweatshop space as emblematic of, you know, points of struggle uh, and uh, protest. And she's wanting us to think of it as a figure that does something a little bit more than that. So to get back to your question as a long winded answer, um, I think that I'm happy that folks are thinking about fashion in much more critical ways and not dismissing it. Um, but I'd like to know a little bit more aside from, you know, who wears what and uh, the politics of, you know, the cost of things, um, because I think that we can get a little bit further uh, than that. Seems like one of the the missing components there is is an interrogation of power, right? And it sounds like your work is really yes. interested in drawing that out. So fashion and style is both pleasurable and fun and, and mm -hmm. about self-making and identity and community, but also about really uneven power differentials. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's right on. So I'm curious how you see your work um, in uh, Chicano and Chicano studies, in trans studies, on style, your um, your fantastic blog, which I want to talk about more in a minute. But how do you see all of these kinds of projects combining art, activism, and academia in the service of social justice? Um, so I think uh, one thing that I really try to do um, is I try to take the work that I do in academia and then also some of the work that I do with like fashion in my public life and my blog, right? And, you know, make some connections in the classroom. Like for me, a lot of the work that I do happens in the classroom and that involves really being thinking very strategically about using the resources that I have available to me at the university to give my students an opportunity to engage with cultural producers and texts that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. So that means that I'm bringing in a lot of people to campus and doing the, making a lot of partnerships to make opportunities happen for my students to have contact with cultural producers and cultural texts that are integrated into the analytics and the content that they're learning in my classroom. And so for me, it's very much about, and I'm not trying to use you know, this very neoliberal university talk about engagement or extending the boundaries of the classroom, but that's what I do. And, I, and I've seen how it really kind of challenges students to become more politicized, to become student leaders on campus, uh, to work with me in relationship to some of the things that they are working on in campus and campus struggles. Um, and so for me, I'm not wanting to say, I'm not talking about visibility at a very um, basic or simplistic sense, but as a brown trans man on a campus that doesn't have a lot of brown people, doesn't have a lot of trans people, for me to be available to students is particularly meaningful. And I try my best to have 
the things that I need to do, say, for example, to get tenure, right, um, parlay its way into creating these opportunities for my students so that, one, I'm doing the things that I need to do to keep my job, but two, I'm also fulfilling what I feel is my mandate uh, to serve uh, students uh, in this land-grant institution, which means that it's also engaging the community outside. Um, I went to public institutions, and so uh, I really take that kind of commitment seriously to create partnerships, to um, take my work uh, that I do and to make it available and accessible and also make myself available to students who need uh, guidance or uh, resources in relationship to kind of the political movements that they're trying to do on campus and outside of campus. So you mentioned your blog, and I think that's a great way mm -hmm. of doing precisely what you were just talking about, kind of making your work available and these ideas available in multiple spaces. So can you tell us a little bit about that blog? Maybe what what got you started on it and um, what where are you going with it in the future, do you think? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I got started on it just because I was, you know, always kind of posting pictures on Instagram anyway. And then I started following all of these other menswear blogs on Tumblr and also on Instagram. Um, and there was always something lacking, like, you know, I learned a lot from the people that I was following, but I needed, I felt like I needed to find a way to kind of distill that information and make it accessible to the people that I know uh, in my communities that would have interest in this. So it's about, say, for example, um, you know, learning about these smaller companies that make like ties or pocket squares or whatever, um, and kind of bringing these more obscure menswear directed companies into direct contact with other folks um, while striking a balance because some of these things are kind of pricey and I don't buy them all the time, but also striking a balance with like how to find these things like on eBay or on Etsy. Um, so I try, I haven't updated in a while, but I do try to highlight the things that I'm able to find for like super cheap um, because once you are able to kind of get uh, a, a grasp of like how to search for things and how to think about fabric, um, then it becomes a little bit easier, like keywords to identify like a quality garment. Um, so that was one of the initial reasons that I wanted to do it. Um, and then, you know, it's fun. Uh, uh, I'm a Virgo, so I, I do like to take pictures of myself. There's some vanity, I think, in, in, in Virgos. Um, and so I thought, I'm going to put this together, I'm getting dressed to go to campus, and so I would like other people to appreciate it too, so that was a part of it. And in the future, I mean, folks have talked to me about maybe possibly taking the pictures and putting them together in a book. Um, I don't cool. know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, especially because the backgrounds are, are, are pretty... Um, I take pictures in the same places all the time, so the backgrounds are pretty continuous. So that's something that could happen in the future. Um, and a good friend of mine who's a photographer and also faculty member on campus, Adela Licona, um, we've taken some pictures together that were featured in uh, one of the Dapper Q um, style write-ups. Um, and she's working with me on this essay that we're writing together that's you know bringing together photography and fashion, right? So really kind of pushing up at what would be considered as fashion photography. Um, so we're wanting to interrogate that a little bit. So she'll be taking pictures of me, but not just me posing with the clothes, but I'll, but rather also interacting with the clothes and, and also paying attention to my body and the other ways in which it's adorned, which in this case is scars and tattoos. That sounds really cool. I want to read that book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this brings me to my favorite question that I get to ask guests. And obviously, the title mm -hmm. of this podcast is Imagine Otherwise. And um, I get to ask each guest kind of what is that way that they are imagining otherwise? What is that other world that you're working towards when you um, when you create your scholarship, when you step in front of a classroom, when um, you put on that pocket square, when you do whatever it is you do in the universe? What is the world that you're working towards? What kind of world do you want? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm thinking, especially this question, I mean, Imagine Otherwise, I think is a great title because I think it's one of the things that I'm always trying to um, encourage my students to do. 
Um, very recently, it's occurred to me that I'm particularly good and probably best at teaching larger classes. So I'm talking 200 person classes. Um, and I really feel as this is the space that I get to do most of the transformative work, even though it's a little bit impersonal. Um, what I've realized that I that is within my reach to do is to make that class for these 200 students who are encountering terms like gender and sex and sexuality uh, for the first time um, and really make that experience something a little bit more uh, I don't want to say personal because I'm not asking them to think about their personal uh, it, like opinions about these things, but rather I'm teaching them a set of analytic skills on, you know, gender women's studies, like what does the field look like, while also, you know, very actively encouraging them to interrogate and let go of some of the values that they put or attach onto these categories, right? So in other words, to have them, to have them think like, no, you don't know everything about gender. Um, so that's something that we need to abandon and to be a little bit more open about what that might mean. So for me, imagining otherwise or kind of the world um, that I'm trying to build is one where I have a broad reach with a lot of students. Um, and after they leave my classroom, they're actively interrogating their place in the world and the relationship that they have to others in relationship to power dynamics and, and inequality. Um, so the world that I would want, why, right, is one where um, the students that I come into contact with and the folks that read my work are troubled <laughs> in the sense that the, what they're reading might make them a little bit uncomfortable and that they're able to kind of push past the discomfort to really kind of question uh, some of the categories that I've disrupted for them and that that would have an impact in, say, for example, how they encounter other folks who are, you know, gender nonconforming uh, or who are um, ethnic minorities, right? So really kind of getting them to, you know, question some of the assumptions that they make about these categories that a lot of freshmen walk into the classroom thinking that something as complex as race is common sense or, or that because they have a gender, that that is somehow stable and fixed in some kind of way. Um, and so if I can get them to change their mind about that and to really think carefully about how they walk through the world very much, you know, could create a condition that is disempowering, that is dangerous, that is, you know, um, not ideal in relationship to someone else that they may not know, and to get them to think about their place, that that could really, you know, create some change in some way. Um, for me, the classroom is the place where I'm most comfortable and the place that I love the most. And so this is a place where I like to think um, that I make that change. And I do really try to create uh, lasting kind of relationships with my students where they can come to me to, you know, continue doing some of the work that they learn in the classroom. Well, thank you so much for being with us and letting us know about the work that you're doing and how you imagine otherwise. Great. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thanks for listening to another episode of Imagine Otherwise. Check out our website at ideasonfire.net to listen to full episodes, read show notes, and see links to the people, books, and projects discussed on the show. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our newsletter to find out when new episodes are released and to get tips to help you rock your interdisciplinary career.